Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. Welcome you again to another roundtable discussion of the Doctrine and Covenants. Joining us today are Matthew Richardson, John Livingston, Good to be here. Stephen Harper, and I'm Guy Dorius. We're all members of the faculty for the Department of Church History and Doctrine at Brigham Young University. Today's topic is our, our sections 18 and 19 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and we'll be uh, discussing those. And uh, Stephen, why don't you set us up? Uh, with the historical context, why are we going to study these together and what, what's happening in Joseph's life at this point? Both of these sections have important doctrinal implications for the atonement of Christ and the resulting commandment to repent. Section 18 was received by the prophet on or before June 14, 1829, because on that day Oliver Cowdery wrote a letter to Hiram Smith which included a big chunk of the revelation, including the, the most uh, memorable words, perhaps the beginning in verse 10, remember the worth of souls is great. The first uh, eight or so verses are speaking directly to Oliver Cowdery, telling him to rely on what he's <coughs> written in the process of translating the Book of Mormon to compile a kind of a, a guidebook that will enable them to organize the church. Uh, look into the Book of Mormon for instructions on how to administer the sacrament, who can be baptized, and what words are to be said, and so forth. The remainder of the verse is speaking to Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer and explaining to them the significance of the apostolic calling that they have, and including in that their, uh, the, the way they're to understand the significance of a single soul and the way they're to to then proclaim repentance to the whole world. You know, I think it's important to mention here then is if we start to talk about the apostolic calling, then one of the things that would precede this, of course, would be the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood. And, and so we can tie that in as somewhere prior to this experience in early June, you know, somewhere after May 15th with the restoration of the, the Aaronic priesthood, you, you have Peter, James, and John coming, restoring the, the Melchizedek priesthood. And then we're gonna see this notion uh, of the apostle coming in here, which is nice. Otherwise, we don't really see that within the text, you know, the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood, but it intimates it throughout this right here. And what a powerful witness to have these young men, you know, Joseph and Oliver, see not only John the Baptist, but Peter, James, and John. And like Jacob says in the Book of Mormon, he couldn't be shaken because he had seen angels. These brethren have seen angels. This you is know, powerful. And there's almost a sense where they were looking forward to this. You, you, you get that when you start to look through the history of the church when Joseph's writing about this. They were promised by John the Baptist that they would receive the Melchizedek priesthood. And it's almost their antsy to be able to have that experience. And, and here it's come. And, and then what takes place is now we take off with what we do with this great power. And it really does focus on the sense of others, the notion of becoming clean, repentance, which was emphasized so much in 14, 15, 16, and even in 11, declare no other thing save repentance, or it's time for us to change, to become like him. And we see that we're empowered through this, throughout these sections. It's, it's great. I like verse 2, when, when the Lord is saying, Behold, I have manifested unto you by my Spirit, in many instances, the things which you have written are true. Wherefore, you know that they're true. And if you know they are true, behold, I give unto you a commandment that you rely upon the things that are written. We would do well, I think, to rely a little more on things that are written. Scripture is powerful. And uh, these brethren, of course, are in on the ground <coughs> floor of, uh, of the Book of Mormon. And, and the Lord's almost taking them through a specialized scripture study course in the Book of Mormon as they do this. And look at the calling that they receive. Uh, I think this is important, at least to point out. In verse 9 it says, Now Oliver Cowdery I speak unto you, and to David Whitmer. And then it says um, that you shall be even as Paul, mine apostle, for you are called even with that same calling. 
that, that we look at this, and Brigham Young mentioned that, the first apostles of the church, you have Joseph Smith, you have Oliver Cowdery, and David Whitmer, in the notion of, in the true sense of the word, when you look at the Greek of, uh, of apostle, apostolos, to send forth to declare a witness. And so here comes these wonderful testifiers um, of the truth, and then as Steve was mentioning, now that you have that responsibility to go out and proclaim and to testify, don't you dare forget something very important. And that's where you come remember to verse 10, the remember the, the worth of and the, the soul. And the thing that they're testifying of, it, it's interesting that they take, that the Lord reminds Oliver that what he had been participating in through the translation and the scribing experience was the Book of Mormon. And he, he reminds him in verse 4, for in them are all things written concerning the foundation of my church, my gospel, and my rock, uh, that that other testament of Jesus, which apostles are out to testify of. They have even another witness of Jesus Christ, and so it ties their apostolic ministry to proclaiming repentance because of the, uh, the gospel, and the gospel by uh, third Nephi definition is the atonement of Christ. And we gain that witness again in the Book of Mormon that Christ came and atoned for the sins of the world. And, and right down here, look at, look at verses 11 and 12, right after 10. For behold, the Lord your Redeemer suffered death in the flesh, wherefore he suffered the pain of all men, that all men might repent, come unto him. He hath risen again from the dead, that he might bring all men unto him on conditions of repentance. And oh, how great is his joy. The gospel. He just yeah. defines the gospel again. Right? It, it even really applies does. an equation. The worth of a soul seems to be the equivalent to the suffering, the pain of all. To remember the worth of a soul is great. How great? Well, it's at least as much as the Lord your Redeemer suffering death in the flesh, suffering the pain of all, so that all might repent and come unto Him. That's really a grand insight to the Savior Himself is, well, how, how much are you worth it to me? You know, and we do this all the time. Is this worth it? How much would you be willing to pay for this? Well, boy, what an insight here is, if you're going to testify me in the apostolic nature, be a witness of me, you need to understand what I think the worth is. How much is it worth it to you, uh, Jesus? As Steve was saying, this is how much it's worth. I'll go through, and, and you'll see that in section 19, is almost a reiteration of the depth of how much he thinks that we are worth it. All of us are worth it, and sometimes it's hard to fathom that and to really appreciate how much the Savior really thinks that I personally am worth what well, he has done. Well, and I think, I think we might start to understand that value, that worth of a soul, when we inherit or adopt some of his spirit children as parents. We start to understand what it is to, to, uh, to do almost anything. A mother's sacrifice for her children from childbirth on. Uh, they get a, the, the brethren have alluded to motherhood being as close to Godhood as there is, and maybe a touch of that, I'll do anything for these, and up the atonement is the, is the manifestation yeah. of God's love for his children and his willingness to offer that redemption. And, and look at verse 19. He, he kind of goes over the attributes, whether it's motherhood or anything else. If, if you have not faith, hope, and charity, you can do nothing. So if, oh, excuse me, go ahead. If, if you have that stewardship then, it seems very clear there for verse 14. So when you understand this and you have those attributes, wherefore you're called to cry repentance, change unto the people. And then here you come to these wonderful verses. And if it so be that you should labor all your days in crying change, repentance unto this people, and bring, save it be one soul unto me, how great shall your joy be with him in the kingdom. And you know, sometimes I remember, especially being a missionary in, uh, in Europe, where sometimes souls weren't coming as rapidly as one would hope, is taking great comfort as, oh, it only matters if one gets one. And I remember a talk by, uh, well, actually, I remember reading a talk by Rudger Clausen, because we're, we're going way back here, 1901, um, where he talked about this section and saying, please remember that that first soul that is saved must be your own, and then you set your house in order. And then he even said something interesting in verse 16, and now if your joy will be great with one soul that you have brought unto me in the kingdom of my father, how great will be your joy if you should bring many souls? And he says that next soul should be your wife and then your children. This notion of setting our stewardships in order, whatever our stewardships might be, not amassing numbers, but fulfilling our stewardship of, of what the Savior would have us do, of bringing his children, you know, bringing our Father in Heaven's children back, because that's what his atonement is about. I like Guy's uh, point about parenting and this point about travail as the, the path to, to joy. Note the juxtaposition of pain and joy. The Lord your Redeemer suffered death in the flesh. He suffered the pain of all. He suffered everything there is. There is no more. 
and how great is his joy in the soul that repenteth. He paid a dear price, and he appreciates the value of a single soul. I love his caution in verse 20, you know, contend against no church. You know, really, in the more ancient scriptures, church doesn't seem to just mean a religious organization. It's almost any organization among mm -hmm. men. But save it be the church of the devil. You know, if we followed that superscript 20B and moved through to see what the church of the devil really is, kind of the pride of the world and rebellion and reaction of a, of a hateful sort, well, that would really apply in the family too. That's you know, right. we want to be very careful what we're sort of picking our battles over, whether it's missionary work, whether it's in the family. Well, and that the idea, this idea of bringing souls, I, I almost see the Lord here trying to say, you know, I've answered David Whitmer, John Whitmer, Peter Whitmer, Oliver Cowdery, Hiram Smith's question, previous sections, what would be of most worth? Bring souls to me, bring souls to me. Now, let me tell you why. Mm -hmm. And this is the why. This is why it's so important to me, because these souls are precious to me, and we have to, in some way, inherit that love that he has for his children or uh, Jesus through the covenant, his children, and we need to inherit that love and have the same uh, desire to bring souls to that which brings us mm -hmm. joy, that knowledge that Jesus atoned. And, I, and I, think, I think that's the definition of charity. I was thinking back to Ether 12 uh, in verse uh, 33, uh, and 34, the Lord defines charity as the act that he uh, accomplished by the atonement. He says in verse 34 of Ether 12, and now I know that this love which thou hast had for the children of men is charity. Wherefore, except men shall have charity, they cannot inherit that place which thou hast prepared in the mansions of my father. Wherefore, I know by this thing which thou hast said that if the Gentiles have not charity, because of our weakness, that thou wilt prove them and take away their talent. And I, I almost see the connection here. The Lord saying, now listen, these souls are so of so such great worth. You need to love them like I do. And that love was manifest in me through the atonement. That's charity. Now, what are you going to do? What's your charitable act? It's far beyond baking cookies and leaving them on a doorstep. Mm. It's bringing souls to this wonderful atonement that we're going to learn about so powerfully in section mm. 19. I love the way that starting in verse 21 through to about, what, 25 or so, take upon you the name of Christ. You know, in marriage, uh, very often women will take upon themselves the names of their husbands as a token of the covenant. And uh, if we think about that kind of engagement, taking upon ourselves the name of Christ, uh, be baptized. If they know not the name hmm, by which they are called, they cannot have place in the kingdom. And it goes all the way through to verse 29. I mean, I, I, if you counted the number of times the name of Christ is referred to, uh, uh, it, it's redundant. In almost every verse from verse uh, 21, to uh, 29, and in fact, I think when you said contend against no church, uh, I, I think the way we do contend is not by arguing over tenants, which we'll learn in, in section 19, it's by proclaiming the name of Jesus, it's by proclaiming repentance and, and bringing people to that name uh, through ordinance and through invitation. Uh, that's well, that's the, know, the whole concept of name is such an interesting thing, your name. The naming, the designation, the the yeah. Mm -hmm. There is power in the name of, the, of Christ, that's for sure. You know, an interesting thing on this that's, that's also wonderful is as you're talking about this notion of inviting and bringing people into, once again, you see in this section a theme that goes throughout the entire Doctrine, Seven, uh, Doctrine and Covenants. In section one, it says the audience is unto all men. And, and then you see this again is as many as would repent shall be saved. All men must take upon them. There's an invitation that this is not exclusive to anyone. It's inviting all men to come. And the way that it is done is a spread by the witnesses. And so by the time you start to get back into 26, you see an interesting thing happening here is we start to talk about things that aren't really going to be accomplished till 1835. And that's the calling of these apostles of the Quorum of the Twelve. And the Lord speaks to them in the future. That, that's exactly right. Once again, it's this notion of laying the foundation so that all will come to pass. I'm going to lay things down line upon line, foundation 
situation. I'm preparing you, or at least getting things ready, so you can be prepared for when the time comes. And, and this is an 1835 experience, but yet you go through and it says, and now let's talk about the 12, and my grace is sufficient for you, and you shall, in verse 32, ordain priests and declare my gospel and have revelation. And then here's an interesting thought in verse 37 is, he, he, he goes through and he gives instructions is, behold, I give unto Oliver Cowdery and David Widmer that you shall search out the 12. And, and later, of course, as we all know, as Martin Harris will be included in that group as the three witnesses as part of the witnessing. Well, and, and now what that leads us to then is, is the worth of souls is so great because of this atonement. And so we, we get pushed to section 19. And, and especially if you consider in verses 34 through 36 of 18, the Lord says, if you've read this, you've heard my voice. Uh -huh. And so what do we get in section 19? we get the actual voice of God telling us about what he did. And it's probably the, the best first person account oh, that we can ever read of the atonement. And, and it it, it, it's powerful in that context here. Let me tell you now, first person, this is what I did. And, and I think that's a powerful transition into I 19. I don't know of any other scriptural text where the savior speaks autobiographically about his atoning experience as he does in this text. It's spoken of elsewhere, of course, by others. Right. But here the Savior uh, speaks of it himself. And there's a, an interesting modesty to it. For, uh, speaking, think, going back to 18, to say, remember the worth of souls is great in the sight of God, that might be the most modest understatement anywhere. That, the price of a soul is the infinite atonement of the, the Redeemer. And in 19, he's going to describe that infinite atonement. He's going to defer the glory as is characteristic of him. Nevertheless, glory be to the Father, he yeah. says in verse 19. Let me talk for just a, a minute about the context of this uh, revelation because it's so potent. And it's to the uh, third witness here. Yes. It's Martin Harris. <laughs> Martin Harris, whom I dearly uh, appreciate because he's like me. He's a fallen mortal. He's desirous to thrust in his sickle. He wants to be involved in the marvelous work. He has mixed motives sometimes. He wants the work to reflect well on him. Uh, he's in tension sometimes between his social uh, reputation and his wealth and what the work is going to require of him. He willingly signs a mortgage to uh, fund the publication of the Book of Mormon in August of 1829. And it has to be filled within 18 months. Now, $3,000. $3,000. <laughs> that would be to do. The idea is that they'll publish the, the first run and they'll sell copies of the book, and the proceeds of those sales will satisfy the mortgage. Now, if it doesn't, uh, that presents an interesting case for Martin Harris. He ke gets word here in early 1830. And now this is just about as the book is to come off the press, that Palmyrans are circulating a petition to boycott sale of the book. Joseph Knight tells us that Martin Harris comes to find Joseph Smith and says, I need a commandment. I need a commandment. He repeats it three or four times, meaning I want a revelation. Joseph says, fill the ones you've already got. <laughs> and he's been reprimanded to, yes. to this point in the Doctrine and Covenants <laughs> Even referred already. to as that wicked man. <laughs> that's right, that's right. He's, he's had a few times. Harris is emphatic, though. He won't uh, go away until the prophet receives a commandment. Now, this points to something very interesting that Professor Bushman has, has discussed, and that is Martin Harris, as well as the others, Joseph Sr., Hiram, people who are older, more socially um, uh, uh, accepted than Joseph Smith are, are coming to him, seeking him out, and consenting to his revelations which is powerful evidence that they are converted to his role as a revelator. They, they really believe, they believe him. Prophet. And Harris doesn't want advice from Joseph Smith. He wants a commandment in the first person voice of Jesus, and the Lord obliges him. You know, you know uh, when he obliges, and you've mentioned the word autobiographical account of the atonement, there's something about the autobiography of this that I think lays a foundation and obliges is, is like, for example, look in verse one. Here's an introduction. I am mm -hmm. Alpha Omega, Christ the Lord. I am he, beginning and end, redeemer of the world. I have finished the will. 
there's something important about this notion of prelude to the atonement. Let me tell you who I am so there's no misunderstanding. It's almost you see, a resume. It really is. Yeah. And, and, you, and you just feel and sense the power of the Savior, not just because he atoned, but because of who he is, including yes. that notion of Gethsemane. I am, we see that notion of coming down is to he is Jehovah. Mm -hmm. So therefore we set him up and we understand his great power from Old Testamental to forward. I am Alpha Omega, be, not only beginning to end, but you know, that's the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. It's almost like I am A and Z, but one of the things he seems to be saying here, and I'm also B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. I'm all Endless. the letters. I'm the and, and, and even beyond I'm the Redeemer, that's right. the judge. And even beyond that, you get down to verses 16 and, or I mean, verse 6, 7, and 8, uh, where he he really is going to introduce a doctrine that really doesn't come out more fully until section 76, and that is that his mission was to redeem all mankind and his his redemption is endless because that is his, his name. name. Again, that title, I am endless. He, 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 I'd never said that. He says right in verse... Uh, it's verse, quality yeah, it's rather quality. than quantity. That's right. Yeah. And, and I never said there wouldn't come an end. In other words, you learn in 76 that hell empties out. And that's a doctrine mm -hmm. that Joseph's really going to appreciate in the future. But here he's alluding to that saying... Uh, you must suffer my punishment because there is law that is endless and I am endless. And you understand that by understanding the way he sets this up. This That's is marvelous. Right. Let me tell you some of my names, by the way. And so then it's so clear by the time you come over and you talk about endless torment, eternal damnation. And by the time you come over and he says, wherefore, endless is my name in verse 10. I, this is, let's add it to the other names that I've told you about. I am Alpha Omega, okay. beginning in endless, eternal. And then, he, and then you see the grand construct right. of, wait, this is all centered upon Jesus Christ. And Th then this he is comes to, Christ. to Martin Harris, who obviously has had to do some repenting in the <laughs> past. And then with that introduction of who he is, it's like, Martin, you ask for this yeah. first person. Here it is. And now verse 13, wherefore I command you to repent. repent. And, and it's like, oh, okay, now I really know who's doing the asking here. And they uh, go to 15. And therefore, here it is again, I command you to repent and then this is the thing I love about this. It's straight up. I'm just going to tell you. I'm not trying to scare you into righteousness. Uh, I'm just going to tell you straight up. Repent lest I smite you with by the rod of my mouth. Which is and, your tongue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then it comes down and it says, and by my anger, your sufferings be sore. And then here we, we see this. How sore? Martin or Almig, you really don't know. And, and he uses the language of the heart. Like you said, he's not intending to manipulate oh. us into repentance here. Uh, we could take lesson from that. That's he's, right. he's hoping desperately right. that Martin will repent, and he's using such strong language precisely so that if Martin repents, he can shoulder the load here. That's right. If Martin repents, it's the I'll Lord who, who right. carries that load. Verse, this is merciful doctrine. Verse 16, I, God, have suffered these things described in verse 15 for all. Why? So that they might not suffer if and they repent. would repent. Exactly what if you're saying. If they would not repent... They must, and note the absolute term, they must suffer even as I. That's the only other possibility beside repentance. Which verse, suffering? Go ahead, John. Uh, sorry, I was just going to say, and then verse 18 <laughs> it really is the core of it. Which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore. Luke talks about, mm -hmm. you know, blood like sweat, but bleed at every pore to suffer both body and spirit and then would or wished that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. You know, I don't know how many of us have had to drink an entire cup of medicine. I remember complaining once about an upper gastrointestinal problem and I had to drink a cup of barium and oh my goodness, but it's nothing, nothing like what he was dealing with. It's almost, don't you feel as I do, as you come to this text, it's almost irreverent for us to engage it. What we're doing here is very valuable, but there's a wonderful sense of um, that we're treading on sacred ground right here mm -hmm. and uh, the, to approach it reverently. Nevertheless, glory be to the Father, I partook and finished my preparations unto the children of man, characteristically deferring the glory to the Father. Now, Martin, if all that's true, for heaven's sake, humble your, uh, repent and humble yourself or I'll do it for you. 
Well, and, and, and then to follow up with your introduction to this, Martin's struggling with some real tangible issues, mm -hmm. the mortgage, his wife, Same and other things. That's with. right. And, and with that backdrop, then the Lord cautions him in verse 23, learn of me, mm -hmm. listen to my words, walk in meekness of my spirit, and you shall have peace in me. Isn't that what Martin's looking for? He's so. looking for peace. And even amidst our trials that are physical and tangible, uh, the, the monetary challenges we have, uh, even marital problems are alluded to here with Martin because yes. he's having marital problems. I think when the Lord says there, alluding to that in 25, don't covet thy neighbor's wife nor seek thy neighbor's life. I don't think Martin is a uh, you An know, adulterous, se yeah. seeking murderous designs here. I think what the Lord's suggesting is that Martin may look to the neighbor and say, I wish I had his wife. He's I wish I had his yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, mine is a little hard to live with of sometimes. Course, it he's sets saying. up for the coveting that he's going to talk yes. about later regarding to his own property. Verse 26, thou shalt not covet thine own property, Yes. but impart it freely to the people. Well, and again, isn't that the higher law? In the, in the, the, the preparatory law was don't cover your, covet your neighbor's property. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden we have a transition. Martin, in the law we're talking about, in that law that I brought, that New Testament, you can't even covet your own property. You come to understand who you are in relationship to me. Well, Go ahead, Matt. Well, well I was just going to say, look at, look at how this comes down in verse 37. As all the things we've been talking about, there's a joyous experience mm -hmm. after it all. Go forth and cry forth re with a rejoicing crying. Rejoicing crying. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord God. And as Steve was saying, almost a reverent, reverent uh, territory and ground that we're, we're standing upon here. There is this element where it brings you where, where when you finish this section, I, I agree with this. You almost want to shout, Hosanna, save me now, yeah. save me and now. Blessed we, be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how grateful we as Latter-day Saints should be to have this first yeah. person yes. account of the atonement Amen. And, and the blessings. I like to think of it as what I call a reorienting revelation. Martin Harris comes in a specific context needing to be turned, and the Lord emphasizes how he does the will of the Father, M more than subtly suggesting, Martin, don't you think you ought to start l emphasizing your will less and mine more? And then this terrific reorientation, pay the debt thou hast contracted with the printer. Martin comes seeking a kind of a, a revelation that resembles a, a kind of a, a payment schedule or something. Okay, Martin, here's when you can expect the mortgage to be, re don't worry, your carnal security will be intact despite all appearances, everything's gonna work out for you. And instead he's given this marvelous uh, treatment of the atonement and then simply said, now on that debt you're worried about, go ahead and pay that. The debt thou hast contracted with the printer. Release thyself <laughs> from bondage. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and this is a section about releasing ourselves from bondage by taking the Lord or allowing ourselves to be taken of him. Yeah. It, it is rejoicing. It's beautiful stuff. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.